I'm Darren Merner, author of Corporate Bravery, CEO and co-founder of Cloverleaf Me. Today, we're going to talk about building brave cultures. We're going to talk about team performance, and we're going to talk about specifically the use of digital nudges to improve your performance and those around you. Stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty interview series. I'm your host, Dolph Barron, and I'm the founder of Full Monty Leadership. Dot com, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything. To find out more, you can go to fullmontyleadership.com. Let me ask you, do you need to up-level your leadership? Of course you do. If you're a leader, it's essential. Well, one, of the, one of the most common ways that we stunt ourselves as individuals and as organizations is when we lack the courage to do the next thing. Today, we're going to look at how you and I could develop more corporate bravery. Stay tuned. Remember, you can now chat about this episode or any past episodes on our Facebook and LinkedIn groups. Just simply look for the Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. If you're a new listener, new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. As always, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever you tune into podcasts. And we always need your help in staying relevant. So please get over there, wherever it is for you rate, review, and please subscribe to the show. You can also catch us on traditional radio stations across the United States every Monday and Thursday. Also look for us on Roku TV, where there's over 100,000 subscribers. And if you're a regular listener, a big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners with a potential reach of 2.5 to 4 million listeners for every single show. We are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. You can listen to us on Google Home and Alexa by simply saying, play Dove Baron podcast. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. As a leader, whether you're a CEO, someone in the C-suite, a sales leader, entrepreneur, or a leader in any capacity, you've likely noticed that we live in a time in a media culture where we're being told and even trained to be fearful. And it's bleeding into organizational culture. So how do we step out of fear and develop true corporate bravery? Well, let's find out together. Our guest on this episode is Darren Marina. Maybe I got that right. <laughs> Darren is the co-founder and CEO of Cloverleaf.me. It's a high-tech startup that builds high-performance teams. Darren, prior to being a full-time entrepreneur, had spent 15 years in a corporate career that spanned Arthur Anderson, Fifth Third Bank, and the Munich Regroup. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me welcome the man who is leading leaders to create corporate culture that is free from fear. And he is the author of Corporate Bravery, Mr. Darren Moran. And the crowd goes wild, young man. I'll have to admit, that's the first time I've gotten that kind of an intro. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we record it for you and we send it to your wife and uh, she can decide whether she wants to use it to wake you in the morning. <laughs> it would probably be more my kids than my the wife. Kids? Okay, good. You got more chance of it from the kids over here. That's good. <laughs> no, so thank you we so always like to start the show is to ask, who is someone that we maybe likely wouldn't know or maybe wouldn't suspect? You know, you're a leader, so who is somebody we would likely not know or suspect who has been a big influence on you? Somebody who has had a lot of impact on how you look at the world and maybe even leadership? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, honestly, and I think I, I mentioned this in the book too, and recount some of the story here, but uh, my very first uh, leader, uh, my direct manager, uh, coming out of college uh, at Arthur Anderson. Um, for those people that uh, are old enough to know who Arthur Anderson is, and uh, you know, before it was the big four, um, uh, Arthur Anderson was one of the most respected accounting firms in the world, globally. And uh, happened to be there during that period where Enron happened, and Arthur Anderson was obviously a big part of that story. Yep. And um, got to experience firsthand what crisis management looks like and how people responded to that, um, you know, both at the individual level, you know, people that are, were fresh out of college and uh, were trying to make decisions about, hey, what does this mean for my life? And, you know, am I going to be able to earn money tomorrow? And, you know, it's, is there going to be a paycheck all the way up to the partners in the organization who, you know, had invested 20 or 30 years in, of their career, um, you know, with that organization and obviously had a significant portion of their wealth tied up in the, um, the success or the failure of the firm. And um, one of the people that had the biggest impact on me and really has continued to guide kind of how I see leadership and, and um, in, you know, in not, not only in a business context, but just in life in general, was a man by the name of Dan Fagan. And, um, you know, through the, through the midst of that crisis, I think he represented a lot of the things that we talk about in terms of high performing teams um, and leading those high performing teams. And one of the first things was trust. Um, and he in, endeared a lot of trust um, with everyone on the team. And part of that was his, the level of transparency and honesty that he showed um, in those moments. Uh, we would have a regular group meeting, you know, and I can't remember now if it was every day or if it was once a week, Monday morning type thing where the partner, the, the local office managing partner would pull the team together and, you know, everyone had just read the headlines on the front of the Wall Street Journal about what was sure. happening and, you know, and, and we were all making our own conclusions about how, uh, you know, what the impact of that could be long term. And um, the office managing partner would often sugarcoat the situation and everybody's kind of looking at each other going, yeah, I don't, I, that's not my assessment of this situation. You know, what's he know that I don't or what motivation might be driving his assessment that's different than mine. And uh, Dan never did that. At, at the end of those conversations, he'd pull us into his office and he would say, look, I'll be the first one to tell you um, when the when the wheels are coming off the bus. And, you know, wheels aren't off the bus, but we got some flat tires. And it just was a really honest, um, you know, assessment of the situation. And, you know, he continued that over the next six months as he looked for opportunities for our team. Um, and he was consistently honest with us about opportunities and how we should think about our own personal uh, career planning in the midst of that crisis. And um, I think a lot of my approach as a manager and a leader today has been shaped by that. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the, this idea of transparency has obviously become more and more popular, and I'm definitely in favor of that, but, but I don't think people really understand what that means until, as you said, there's a crisis. And right. now there's a crisis and, you know, oh, suddenly, yeah, we were being really transparent until this came up. That's, that's fascinating. Now, one of the things you say is that the American culture has become a culture of fear and that is bleeding into organizational cultures. So tell us what you believe corporate bravery is. Yeah, I think, you know, part of part of the book is talking about how do you create a culture um, and culture is a pretty loaded word. You know, it's not just ping pong tables and beer kegs. Um, and it really comes down to a, a lot of the individual practices and how leaders respond in certain situations. So, you know, part of uh, culture, at least in terms of uh, how fear is, you know, infiltrating our corporate cultures and how it's impacting how we how we look at or how we make the decisions that we make inside the business context on a daily basis comes in a lot of a lot of different ways. Um, you know, I think even just as you mentioned, our our media. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I've got the ticker, the stock ticker uh, running in the background in my office, um, you know, stock market has a bad day. It you'll look around and it influences people's behavior. It influences Oops. their psyche. Um, and, you know, if you're watching the local news at night, you know, how does that impact, you know, the, the 
your own mental preparedness um, as you go go into work the next day, prepared to lead a group of people and offer direction to those individuals. I think beyond that, there are some very specific ways that fear um, uh, impacts uh, our day-to-day -day work, right? Um, Amazon is a really great example. Um, and, you know, it seems like they're entering new industries every day. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've watched people in those industries where Amazon makes an announcement that, hey, you know, they're going to build their own logistics and distribution network. Well, suddenly, you know, it, it creates a sense of fear um, or it has the opportunity to create a sense of fear for those people who aren't um, certain and sure of who they are, not only as an individual leader in the context of that organization, but also more importantly, the strategies and the goals and the direction of the organization that they're currently leading. Mm -hmm. You know, knowing who they are, knowing what they compete best at, knowing what their core competencies and strengths are, uh, keeps them from being, uh, you know, just really kind of whipped about by some new competitor in the market or, you know, some new government action that might create a, you know, difficult competitive environment for them moving forward. So, so again, what do you see as being um, corporate bravery? What, what would be your definition of corporate bravery? Yeah, I think in, in the, you know, when you're staring those situations down, I gave a, gave a few there, when yeah. you're, you're faced with those situations, um, you know, how do you approach that? Having a really strong sense of who you are as an individual leader, having a strong sense of who your team is and your organization, how you compete, you know, what are your strengths and what are, you know, uh, what are the opportunities that your organization has that is unique and different um, and really leaning into that um, and, and having that strong sense of identity and purpose, um, whether that's an individual or as a leader or as the organization as a whole, um, is, is really the definition of being brave. Um, and that's the thing that will, will help you navigate uh, difficult circumstances, whether it's government actions or it's a new competitor or any, of, any number of things that allow fear to kind of creep into your organization. Uh, it really starts with that really strong sense of identity and purpose. So it's really, I mean, to, to summarize that, it's, it's a clear sense of identity and who you are and the purpose, the reason why you're doing what you're doing, and to lean into that in the face of fear. That's right. And to recoil from it and try and compete with Amazon or whoever it might be in that moment. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that, you know, there's not going to be difficult circumstances ahead, right? You're going to have to tighten budgets or, you know, you may have to approach the market differently. You may have to, uh, you know, completely rechange your supply chain. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, not being wrecked with fear and kind of getting paralyzed and stuck in the moment, but really having that sense of uh, this is who we are. And this is how we can compete, cast a vision for your team, and then chart the course and move forward. Right. Now, one of the things um, you know, I said in the intro, of course, is that you are the founder of Cloverleaf, um, your company, which is a technology platform. Uh, I was reading that it's, you know, uh, that you believe that things are built on five dimensions, which is behaviors, strengths, motivators, skills, competences, and your unique role. Tell us a little bit more about that and how that applies to any leader, really, how, how do we sort of, because that, you know, there's a, each of those five pillars is, is, a, is a big piece in and of itself, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, and, and really, Cloverleaf is, was an outgrowth of corporate bravery. Um, you know, anytime, and I, I know you know this well, right, uh, having, having authored a few books in your time, um, that you get to the end of that, and, you know, one of the, one of the last things that you want to have happen for your readers is to get to the end of that and say, okay, well, now what? What do I do with this? Mm -hmm. And I was left with a sense uh, of that at the, at the end of writing that book and, and saying, man, I wanna provide tools and resources for people to really take the next step with this. Right. And one of the things when we, when we think about teams, high-performing teams, and whether that's you know, a, a small cross-functional team or it's a department or a division or the entire enterprise that you're, you're, you're in charge um, of leading is this sense of context, right? Individuals 
um, are you know complex on the surface, but then you put them together with other people and there's an environment where people can grow and thrive. Mm -hmm. And so those five pillars, um, as you, as you mentioned it, um, are all pieces of that context. Um, it's not, you know, the exclusive exhaustive list of, of contextual elements that can allow people to thrive, but that's a really great starting point. And I think oftentimes organizations tend to just focus on the skill piece of that or the proficiency side of it. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much more that comes into play. Um, so, you know, individual behaviors and some of those things are hardwired from the earliest, earliest days of our life. Yeah. Right. And uh, really trying to understand and, and, and diagnose what some of those things are and how that impacts our own um, ability to lead or perform, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. I think also that sense of purpose, those, those goals, those values, those expectations that we bring um, in every day. So it is, it's a really complex kind of set of, you know, ingredients that we need to mix together to create something that's high performing. Now that platform um, is one of the things it has is a lot of assessments like, you know, disc or whatever it might be, strength, uh, you know, whatever, strength finder, whatever it might be. Um, in that context of, of those uh, tests, uh, I, you know, I, I think that oftentimes um, people get attached to a thing and they, oh, you know, you gotta have disc. Right. And well, uh, I, yeah, okay. Maybe it's good, but what is it missing? You know, um, have you tried Colby? Have you tried strength finder? Have you tried, you know, um, endograms or, you know, I mean, there's a million of these different kinds of tests. Um, tell us what is the, cause your platform has a lot of that, those tools available. What is the biggest misconception about what you guys do in that context? Because, I'm sure you've 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 wrestled with misconceptions about what what you're doing there with that. Absolutely. So I mean that space is large, right? There are a thousand different assessments. Uh, you, you mentioned a million, but and it does feel like a million, but sure, I'm sure. uh, it's, it's, it's roughly a thousand uh, that are on the market. But it creates a pretty pretty strong sense of confusion in the marketplace, mm -hmm. right? Um, if I say I'm a nine or I'm an ENTJ, you know, it's it's loaded. Um, right for people that understand that nomenclature and they have that vocabulary, it has a lot of meaning to it that someone being introduced to it for the first time isn't gonna have the, the benefit of, of understanding that. But it also that's can be a real clicky thing. You know, that's one of the other things. Oh, I, you know, I, I'm an eight with a five wing or I'm a, you know, I'm a this letter, that letter, that letter, or I'm a beige or I'm a, I'm a blue, you know? That's right, yeah. For people coming into a culture where that vocabulary exists, it can feel pretty, uh, it can be, feel pretty daunting, right? Because they're speaking a different language and it's, it's really difficult to understand that. And I think part of what we do is really kind of help cut across that, right? You don't have to be an expert in Enneagram or DISC or Myers-Briggs um, to really get personal and career development out of it. And one of the more important aspects that, you know, when we looked at that overall assessment space, we found a few different aspects that we felt like, you know, in terms of the delivery and the approach in the marketplace was broken. Um, one, you know, you typically get this 40 page PDF document that was all about you. Um, mm. And it was intended to really kind of decipher the code of what does a nine mean or what does a, you know, a D mean. And, um, but no one's reading that, you know, if it's more than 140 characters today, we've zoned out. Um, and so it, first off, it's all about you Two, It's just too much content. It's too yep. overwhelming. And so part of what we did, and, and then really kind of the third piece is uh, they tend to be point in time opportunities, right? So you got that 40 page PDF, you had that half day offsite or that one day team building session. And typically everyone walks away from that. And they're excited that they learned one or two things about themselves mm -hmm. and self-discovery is a huge part of the journey, right? But how do we, how do we activate that? How do we actually use that to change behavior and, and really drive performance. And that was really kind of the missing piece. And one of the things that we looked at is, you know, the average worker uh, has 115 different interactions with other people throughout their day 
in tools like email, calendar, Slack, or Microsoft Teams, right? So collaboration or communication tools. So that presents a really unique opportunity for us to take the essence of those assessments, those tools, right? Like Myers-Briggs and Enneagram and activate it at a point in time where people are communicating or interacting with, with others. And that's really been the differentiator for us in the marketplace. And, and that's how we drive behavior. Um, you know, most psychologists will tell you it's those small changes, small repeated changes over time that actually drive you towards big, you know, uh, improvements and results. And we're using that same philosophy or that same concept, uh, but in the workplace and, and based on the relationships and the people that you're interacting with on a daily basis. So how do you, in the work that you're doing, how do you get that translation from the report to the action? Because yep. as you said, people are very excited about learning new exciting shit that they can go home and talk to somebody about and say, oh you know i just found out i'm a four you know and it, and here's what a four is or whatever it might be but that's very different than the integration activation and really using it in a in a how do, how what is the bridge that you guys use to do that yeah, so a big part of it is leveraging the unique scores for each of those things, right? So underlying that four or underlying that ENTJ is a set of, of you know, uh, assessed values. Yeah. And we're using that data behind the scenes along with data about who you're interacting with, who you're on a team with, mm -hmm. what role do you play in that team relative to the other people on the team. And then what we do is we have small pieces of content that get pushed out to you based on the circumstances, uh, your interactions with those people. And we categorize those things in about eight different categories. So everything from personal development to leadership development, uh, conflict, um, you know, how do you manage through conflict in certain situations? Or, you know, how do we potentially head off conflict by providing additional context? I'll use that, that C word again, um, providing some additional context about how you're, you, you know, how you might be perceived by the person on the other end of that communication. Um, so there's a really kind of complex algorithm um, and we use machine learning with that as well uh, to deliver that content in a way that's relevant to the relationship uh, or the other person on the, on the other end of that conversation and the specific context of the work that you're doing. So what is the, you know, I, I, you've, been, you've been doing this for a while now, you've got your company, you've got the people you're working with. What are some of the, can you share with us a, uh, maybe a highlight and a low light, a, uh, uh, you know, like, wow, this is really great, but this is really frustrating about it. Uh, just about the process. Yeah. I mean, you know, cause you, you're, you're, you're there helping people do this. And, and I mean, I, you know, even in my, th you know, I love what I do. I adore what I do, but I, you know, I got some highlights and I got some frustrations where I'm, you know, uh, I might have a little bit less hair in places from like, ah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think in terms of the work that we do, right. I mean, I think the thing that energizes all of us is when we hear those stories of people who, you know, the light bulb turned on for them. Right. Yeah. Or, you know, there was a specific relationship that they struggled with and we all have that, right. Everyone has those relationships in your life that are just difficult. And, um, so hearing stories where people have, you know, been using our product and have had breakthroughs in those relationships and it's gone on to, you know, empower not only a, a better relationship with that individual, but more importantly, allows them to overcome a hurdle in how they're doing the work on a daily basis. I think that's the thing that really energizes our entire team. You know, gosh, I don't know that I have enough time on this podcast to talk about all the frustrations. Um, you know, there are sales conversations and investor conversations that I have on a regular basis um, that are just frankly draining. <laughs> yeah. They don't get the vision or, um, you know, it's a potential partnership and someone's, you know, stuck in a current way or model of doing, doing their business and can't see beyond, um, you know, the, the current reality that they're faced with. And um, those are the things that, you know, when I, when I go home at the end of the day, 
you know, if I've lost a few more hairs and you can, you can tell I've lost quite a few along the journey. You had a bit of a frustrating journey. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's typically been when I've had those days where I've had more kind of life, um, you know, life draining conversations and I've had uh, life giving conversations. You know, you, you talk a lot about the importance of building these teams and, and what good teams are. Can you give us maybe a, uh, some tips on how we can create teams that have really what I would call it, um, a synergistic alchemy that they people who come together and create something that is seems quite naturally to generate something far greater than what they are than all of moving parts. Yeah, it's interesting that you you position that question that way too, because really, you know, not only was Cloverleaf an outgrowth of the of the book, but you know, the last experience that I had before starting Cloverleaf um, was with a, a digital video agency and. We would do 35 to 40 concurrent video projects and we had, you know, a team, cross-functional team, designer, uh, creative directors, um, you know, a, a producer um, on these video projects. And what we saw was the success or failure of those, the, you know, the outcomes of those projects really rested on the combinations of people that we put together in those teams, right? That secret sauce, that feeling, and, and all of us have had teams where, you know, we've looked back on, you know, nostalgically, like, man, if I could recapture that feeling, yes. you know, yeah. whether that's a sports team or it's a team at work or it's, you know, it, just in life. Um, and so a big part of that is, you know, really kind of helping people understand what are their unique contributions in the context of that team. And again, I'm going to use that word context. Yeah. Um, it, you used the word strengths and I think, uh, strengths are a big part of that. Right. You know, if I understand the types of work that gives me energy and that I excel at and where does that, where do I find complementary pieces in my organization or in my team, people that I can partner with, um, where those things that are life draining and, and, you know, not energy giving, um, are the things that they excel at and how, how can we put those pieces together so that we can create something powerful. So we call that context, but I think there are other really important pieces to creating high performing teams. Uh, you had Robin um, Dreek on uh, recent, or well, I guess it wasn't recently, um, you know, 12 to 18 months or so. And the whole, the whole episode was focused on trust yep. and can't understate trust enough. And I know Patrick Lencioni, you know, has, has built an entire, you know, life um, and a career off of, off of trust and, and the dynamics of trust in the context of teams and organizations. And I don't want to gloss over that. I think that's, that's wildly important, not just from leader to uh, team members, but peers in the same team as well. And how, how are you establishing trust there? Um, communication is another piece of that. So how we communicate. And unfortunately, I think there are more ways to communicate today than ever, um, which only creates more confusion, oftentimes in the context of the team, more opportunities for mistrust or, you know, misconceptions to creep in, in terms of how we do work. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, again, that, that word context is really loaded. So I mentioned strengths, but there's a lot of aspects to that. You know, my co-founder um, hates fluorescent lights. <laughs> you know, that's such a small thing, but you know, her, her productivity drops by 50% if she's in an environment, right? A physical environment where there are fluorescent lights and there's no natural light. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's also a part of context, but um, you know, maybe a, a, you know, an overlooked or kind of an afterthought. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, when we go in and work with companies, one of the things we talk about is, um, subjective and objective uh, and collective. So there's a collective culture. There's an objective culture, which is what you think your culture is, which is different than what the culture is. And then there is a personal subjective culture. Uh, and part of the su personal subjective culture might be something, as you just said, which is, you know, you want the best out of me? Give me a window. That's Not right. because it's high status, but because I have sad syndrome and I need natural light. And if I don't get it, then at least put a couple of natural light lights on my desk. 
right? So, you know, I have all the time, I have, uh, because I have a very small window in front of me, not because of any other reason, but I understand brain chemistry. I have yep. two full spectrum lights on me at all times. Yep. Right? Full spectrum natural lights are on me at all times while I'm working. And, be, and I notice on the days, every now and then I just forget. I just forget to turn them on when I come in. And I'm like, 11 o'clock, oh crap, I'm just bagged. Yeah, it, it has, it has, a, yeah, it has a huge impact. And that's like, we're talking about natural light, but how many other environmental factors? Absolutely. To that? And that's and just I think, one example, of course, right? And that's right. what I'm trying to have people understand here is, is the subjective context of culture to me, right? So, you know, if, if I had to work, I don't, it's not how my life works, but if I worked in a place where I had to work next to somebody who smoke, but obviously wouldn't smoke at work, but I can smell it on their clothes. I personally am highly allergic to that. So my right. productivity is going to be terrible because I'm all day focused on how this is bothering me and creating breathing problems and eye problems. And, you know, and we don't think about these right. things. And when we said, well, you know, you're not really performing. Well, there's, what are the other factors? And I, I like the fact that you, take that into consideration where I think that oftentimes it is missed. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the other pieces that I see, even for organizations who get some of those things, right. Right. Like maybe they've invested significantly in the physical work environment yep. um, and they've created those things like natural light. They tend to still create a one size fits all approach. Mm -hmm. um, so like uh, there's been a lot of conversation over the last year or two about open offices, right? I mean, everybody kind of, that was the trend in, 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 you know, the big, big business is like, Hey, let's go to open floor plans. And, um, you know, now that, that pendulum is kind of swinging back in the other direction and they're saying like, Oh, I look at all these negative consequences of open floor plans. The reality is we shouldn't, it shouldn't be an all or nothing proposition, right? We're, we're not, we shouldn't go back to the days of completely walling off everyone or creating these high cubicle walls or, you know, completely tearing all of those things down for everyone. Because the reality is we all have different and unique needs. And if you want to get the best productivity out of each of us individually, um, you know, you have to really factor in the context for us to be successful. When I give presentations, um, you know, with, with different groups, I love to talk about two specific stories that represent this really well. Mm. One, one is in a sports context, and I understand sports analogies aren't always great in the, in the context of business, but, you know, many of us still enjoy sports, so I'll use the first one. Sure. Um, and, it's, and it's NBA players. There was a, a study done uh, with NBA players, and when they moved teams, whether they were traded or, you know, signed off of waivers or whatever the case may be, it took them 21 days to recover their pre-trade or pre-transaction you know, transaction performance. Mm -hmm. And that, that's exactly what we're talking about, right? It's that context. Their skill level didn't change no. for those 21 games. Um, but in fact, it was the context. It was the, the players that they were playing with and creating a sense of understanding of how they play and how they can play with them. Another one more specific to the corporate context is um, when we look at investment bankers on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. um, they did a study of star performers uh, with investment bankers. And when they left their firm, it took them on average five years to recover their performance at the prior firm, right? And it has nothing to do with the overall talent level. No. And I think, unfortunately, we get a little too focused on talent. You know, I, I also love to talk about how, you know, the, the job search um, websites like, you know, Indeed and LinkedIn and, you know, it, the list goes on and on. Uh, if you listen to those advertisements or you, you see messages from those organizations, oftentimes it's find the needle in the haystack right? Yeah. Find that really unique once in a lifetime talent. And oftentimes it's less about that. And it's understanding the context and the circumstances for people interacting together to be successful. Yeah. You know, one of the things, um, this is an analogy I use in, around the same thing, which is, um, are you married? Yes. Were you with somebody else before that? Yes. Was your partner with somebody else? Yes. Is your partner a great partner? Yes. Are you happily married? Yes. Would your partner say you're a great partner? Yes. Do you have a good relationship? Yes. Then why didn't your last relationship work out? 
Why didn't your partner's last relationship work out? Because it's not just whether you are good, it's whether you're a good fit. Right. I, and, yeah. and what we try to do, I think that this is one of the things I, I say at both sides when I'm speaking to an individual or when I'm speaking to a company, which is stop looking for people who will fit in and stop looking for a place to fit in. Look yeah. for a place where you know that who you are belongs and where you're looking for people who belong here. They, they're supposed to be here. This is the place they've actually been waiting to come to rather than trying to, because when we fit in, we're trying to mold and twist and pretzel ourselves to shove into the gap. And what that means is that part of us is always going to get left out. And so that's a really important piece is to say, okay, what does it take for us to really belong here as opposed to fit in? Because, you know, you, you can fit into a pair of pants that are too tight. You can be uncomfortable and you can probably even get away with it for a while. But you're never going to be able to move the way you need to move in a pair of pants that are too tight. And I, th and I think in many ways, that's what a culture is. It's a pair of pants that are too big and you've got a belt on to try and pull them up. Or that it's too tight and it's just bloody uncomfortable and you can't breathe. As opposed to, no, this is, this is a great fit for me. This is where I belong. I, I that's right. That's, it's so cool that you, you're focused on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's pretty easy for people to make assumptions mm -hmm. um, in the circumstances if performance drops that it must be the other person. Yes. Um, instead of looking at the circumstances and saying, what's changed, right? Yes. Um, and, and I think, uh, unfortunately, too often, it's easy for us to dismiss. It's the easy way out, right? Um, to just say, hey, it's, it's their issue, it's their problem, and we can, we can kind of move on and, and go to the next hot, sexy thing that uh, makes sense for, for our team or our organization. Always easier to point the finger. Talk to us a little bit about um, something that, that I think is quite unique about what you're talking about, which is the importance of digital nudges. Tell us what a digital nudge is and why they're important. Yeah, I think, you know, we're seeing more and more of this, right? I mean, as, as our life revolves around, uh, you know, our, our mobile devices, um, it, we're, kind of, we're kind of conditioned now to look at these uh, pings that happen, you know, consistently throughout our day. Uh, oh, I've got a new text message. I missed this phone call. I'm, oh, you know, uh, I'm using this app and it's telling me that I forgot this thing, right? So over the last few years, we've kind of been conditioned um, in a way that really kind of supports this idea of digital nudges. So how can we leverage the way we use mobile devices, the way we use technology to communicate with each other and to get work done, uh, but for good, right? So instead of you know, recommending the next YouTube video that we can kind of get sucked down a rabbit hole on um, and end up you know, losing two hours of our life on uh, you know, uh, crazy memes, um, how can we use that for good? How can we use that same kind of concept and approach to not only create a plan and move you down a path towards higher performance, but also kind of improve the overall, um, you know, performance of the team or the organization as a whole. And so, you know, I mentioned uh, earlier uh, just about when, when we were talking about what Cloverleaf does and who we are, um, the fact that we integrate with a lot of those tools. And we integrate with those tools for a couple of reasons. One, because it gives us some really great data and context that we can use to tailor um, those nudges uh, to be appropriate for the context. Mm -hmm. But the other reason is because that's where you're living all day, every day. You know, if you're not face-to-face -face, um, in a meeting or, you know, heads down, you know, you know, pounding out code or doing something like that, the majority of our day is focused on, you know, a handful of applications, email, Slack, or Microsoft Teams, uh, depending on which ecosystem you're in, yep. and um, your calendar. You know, I'm, I'm ruled by my calendar at this point. Um, and so how do we leverage those tools that people are using all day, every day, to really drive behavior and improve performance. And so that's, that's how we view digital nudges. I mean, there are a lot of other examples um, out there, not just in the corporate sphere, but um, you know, I've been testing out an app called Noom um, that is all about personal fitness and health. Mm. And um, same, same basic concept, right? Uh, what are these little habits that you can form throughout your day uh, to improve some aspect of who you are and where you wanna go? Yeah, and, and again, uh, one of the things I like about that is 
you know, as you said, we uh, were constantly being nudged. You know, oh, the ping on my phone or whatever it was, the notifications on my phone of some kind. Um, but actually, that is a really great way to build some really terrible habits around focus and commitment and, and, and even being in a flow. But you can also use exactly the same thing because every, everything is a double-edged sword to pull you into being focused and, and keeping you on that, you know. And as you said, with health or fitness, like, so, you know, I have my phone set up when I'm not recording, but my phone is set up to send me a notification at 20 minutes. And at 20 minutes, it just it sends me a very quick flash. And all that is is stand up or sit down. Right. <laughs> and it's yeah. just, okay, so I'm going to stand up for 20 minutes now or I'm going to sit down for 20 minutes. And it's, you know, because I'll get into a work mode and I'll sit and it's like, oh, shit, I've been sitting there nine hours and I've been holding my pee for three. <laughs> <laughs> right? And it's not unusual, right, for people to go through that. So you're absolutely right. I think it can be used very, very positively. Yeah, right, I, I, go on. Yeah, let, let me just make one more quick point on that too. Yeah. I think you know we're recording this podcast at the first of the year, so a lot of people are making you know New Year's resolutions and plans and goals for the coming year, and um, I think for a lot of people it's easy to fall into the trap of you know setting those big goals at the beginning of the year, um, and you know you stay pretty focused on it through January, and then February comes along, and you know by the time March or April rolls around, you've got no chance, right? Like you've moved on to something else, and life has happened. And I think that's the other nice benefit of digital nudges is it really kind of creates this expectation or this environment that you don't have to uh, take it all in one step, right? And, and we all know that that's not how things get accomplished in life. You know, you don't go straight to becoming, you know, a millionaire or straight to becoming the CEO of the company. Of course you do. It's uh, overnight, man. <laughs> Nobody told you. It happens overnight. Uh, you know, I like to think that it does, but at least in my life, it's not, it's not been that way. Yeah. And um, so we're, you know, that's the other thing is I think we want to take advantage of the fact that like, hey, this is, this is truly how you build something sustainable and how you get to a new place is small daily steps uh, to get you there. Yeah. So let's go on to uh, what we call a lightning round. A um, little bit more playful. What? Uh, sure. What, what brings you joy, Darren? Oh, my gosh. My not, family not, brings not me a ton of joy. But joy. Yeah, no, my family brings me a ton of joy. Um, in fact, uh, last night I was talking to my wife, and uh, we were moving into our bedtime routine, and uh, uh, I have nine-year-old twin girls, and one of them just passed by me in the hall, right? We were going opposite directions, and just the way she looked at me over, her, over the corner of her shoulder – um, it just struck me and it brought all of these emotions of, you know, watching, watching your child grow into, you know, an adult. And it was this, just this moment in time. And I, I stopped her in the, in the hallway and I said, Hey, come back here. Like, let me see you. Um, because I really just wanted to take in the full experience of who this little girl, um, you know, the woman that she was growing into. And, um, I, I just really, you know, I, my, my children happen to be 12. I have a 12 year old son and nine year old twin girls. And they're at this age, this really unique age where it feels like every week or every month um, is just a really, you know, it's really influential in, in be them becoming the adult that they're going to be. And um, I just, I live in those moments right now and it truly does bring me a ton of joy. Yeah. I, uh, last weekend, uh, our nine-year-old granddaughter was with us for the weekend and just sitting with her and reading with her. And I'm a, I'm a goofy grandparent, you know, so I read in weird voices and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and uh, you know, she, her, one of her greatest joys is to fart on me, right? <laughs> because she can get away with it, right? right. You know, and and so, so she's like always trying to aim a butt at me for that reason, right? And, and, and I was saying to my wife, you know, yeah, it's kind of gross, so what? But Jesus, how long am I going to have this? That's right. right? Yeah. You know, and and we, we forget that. We, you know, there's going to become a point quite naturally, frustratingly, but naturally, where she's probably going to be a snotty little teen who <laughs> probably doesn't want to talk to me because I'm an old fart. And 
you know, and I don't know anything. You know, that's the natural evolution of development. Um, so take it in, you know, and so right. I think it's wonderful that you actually stopped, which I don't think we do enough of, and actually stopped and took it in. And, 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 and I love what you said to her. I want to see you. You know, that's, yeah. that's because human beings, I mean, you know, as you know, my background is in psychology and, and the human beings, people talk, I say to people, what do people want in real world's love? You know, yeah, we do. But what we want even more than that is to be acknowledged, to not feel invisible. We, because yeah. if you love me, but I feel invisible, I don't feel it. That's right. But if, That's I, right. if I feel like you see me, I feel like you recognize me. You, you can hear me and see me and you can take me in. And so I love to be known. Yeah. I love that right. you did that. Absolutely. That's awesome. Thanks. Thank, yeah. thank you for sharing that with us. What's a guilty pleasure for Darren? Oh my gosh. Candy crush. <laughs> What's that? I oh, hate the that. Game, candy crush. oh yeah. The little game on your phone. Um, Every time someone sees me playing it, I feel, I feel completely embarrassed. <laughs> That's it. great. I do it. In those moments when I need to not think, um, Candy Crush does come out on my phone. Is that right? That's, that's very cool. That's very cool. In a parallel universe, what's your career? Meteorologist. <clears throat> Absolutely. I, really? I'm totally fascinated by weather. You know, I don't think I'd be one of those people that get in a car and chase tornadoes um you know in the spring but um i am just completely fascinated by the weather and how different parts of the of the country and of the world are impacted by geography and how weather is influenced uh influenced by that and influencing um you know our environment as well very cool have you always had an interest in weather as a kid i, I think at least as early as i can remember I've been fascinated by the weather. Uh, my parents had a barometer hanging outside on the at the house. And um, I remembered just trying to grasp the concept of what pressure was, what right? Pressure was. Right, absolutely. I was like, I don't understand that concept, right? I can't see it, I can't feel it. And um, that was probably one of the earliest moments that I thought like, man, I'm, I wanna know more about this. It, it, you know, that's interesting because um, <clears throat> I knew nothing about that. and. I, my business partner in Australia, Phil, he would say, he'd say, have you noticed it was a bit funky today? And I go, yeah. And he goes, cause the barometric pressure is below a thousand. I'm like, <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? And I started to notice that that actually is a factor. Cause, you know, so much of how we are, not who we are, but how we are has factors we don't think about. Like we talked about with fluorescent lights versus full spectrum lights and right. like barometric pressure and you know all those kinds of things like uh, 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 circadian rhythms and sleeping and all those you know there's so many amazing fascinating factors and so it's really interesting to me that, that weather was was that for you um, <clears throat> because it's have you seen the have you seen the is it called the aeronauts the new movie no, I've not seen that. I, I, I've seen the preview, yes. I am very familiar with it. Um, I had I no interest in it whatsoever. And it was over the Christmas break, and my wife's like, do you want to watch it? I'm like, yeah, okay, sure, whatever. What did really you think about it? Oh, it was that's great. really good. I don't know how realistic it was, but it was really good. Well, the, the funny thing is... Better than I would. Yeah, the funny thing is, last night I told my wife, um, so one of, one of the twin girls... Um, is also very interested in the weather. And it's usually just because she needs to know what to wear for school the next day, sure. right? But now it's gotten to the point in our house where we just ask her, you know, what's the temperature tomorrow? Or, you know, what is it supposed to rain? Oh, really? And That's cool. Knows. And so maybe she's following in my footsteps. Maybe <laughs> maybe I can live vicariously exactly. through her interest in the weather. <clears throat> of course, no parent would ever do that to their child. No, oh, never, of course. <laughs> Well, as we're, as we're finishing up, Darren, uh, and I'm going to ask you to share um, in, in a moment where people can find out more about you and all your resources, but where I like to finish is to say, please give us a piece of practical advice that our listeners, our viewers can go away and put into action in the next preferably 24 to 48 hours. Yeah, I think one of like a super practical thing, if you're not doing stand-ups, right? And if I know that's kind of been popularized by 
uh, agile software development or at the agile approach um, to doing business, lean, lean startup. It's all kind of in that sphere. Um, if, if you're not doing some form of stand up, I highly recommend it. Um, you know, just that, that ability to communicate, what am I working on? What are my blockers? You know, what, what are the things that I'm accomplishing or important to me um, is really, really valuable. So I mentioned, you know, what are the, what are the, what are some key factors for team success? And I mentioned both communication and trust. Mm -hmm. And I think stand ups uh, go a long way towards uh, improving that, you know, don't let it become a, an hour episode every day because that's going to waste people's time and, and energy. But, you know, we've gotten to the point where we use Slack on a daily basis and we just Slack our stand up and um, you know, people read that. It's really important to make sure that everybody knows, you know, what, what we're each working on and uh, we have an opportunity to, to clear obstacles out of the way for each other. So before we go any further with that, um, because I'm always cautious around jargon, right? Because, you know, like, so yep. context or whatever it is. So for anybody who doesn't understand, what's a stand-up? Yeah, it's, it's a it's really- standing up at your desk. Yeah, although, although for many people, they do like to actually physically stand up. Sure. Um, but, it, you know, obviously if you're remote teams or distributed teams, you can't do that. It can't be in person. That's part of the reason why we use Slack. Yeah. Uh, but it's really just taking a moment out of your day um, to communicate what are the most important things that you're working on that day. Um, what are your blockers? Um, and if you, you need some help from another team member to overcome that blocker, and um, just kind of uh, overall a sense of what you're doing. And um, I think it creates accountability, creates transparency. Uh, it's, it's all of the things that we know are important to building high performing teams. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Darren. Please, share, this has been great. Please share with our uh, viewers and our listeners where they can find out more about you and your company and all the wonderful resources that you have. Absolutely. So they can go to cloverleaf.me.me. .me, so that's a little bit different. It's not .com. I think that'll take you to a cold storage facility. So you don't want that. Uh, cloverleaf.me. Um, and you can find out all about what we're doing, um, you know, with, with our technology. Uh, if you want to know more about corporate bravery and, you know, want to access the book or maybe see some other guides and resources around eliminating a fear-based um, culture and mindset in your team or in your organization, you can go to corporatebravery.com. So corporatebravery.com or cloverleaf.me. That's right. I really want to thank you for being with us today, Darren. It was a pleasure and honor, and I hope you'll stay with us to the end. It was uh, some really good, good insights here that we all got to just take a step back, breathe into. So for you, dear listener, dear viewer, if you want to hang out with other conscious leaders and chat about this episode or any past episodes, go over to either Facebook or LinkedIn into our groups there and look for the Leadership and Loyalty podcast. Um, it, when, if you're ready to really develop your leadership and loyalty in your organization, then come talk to us at full montyleadership.com to find out how you can hire me Dov Barron as a speaker or strategist for your organization go to fullmontyleadership.com forward slash consulting or fullmontyleadership.com forward slash speaking it's where we provide you with the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets inside of your organization by tapping into purpose fullmontyleadership.com because you can't outsource authenticity. I want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about how you can lean into a greater level of corporate bravery. I'm Dov Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness to reach the next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out.